Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Today's, today's episode is brought to you by Christian Focus Publications. Uh, visit christianfocus.com to, uh, for the latest releases in Christian theology and bi- biblical studies and reference books. Get 15% off by using the code equipping at checkout. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to this episode. It's going to be a great one today. I have uh, my new friend, Sean DeMars, with me. Uh, Sean, welcome to the, to the podcast, brother. Glad to be here, buddy. Yeah, can you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your life, your marriage, your ministry, any ministry projects you're working on, those types of things? The most important thing about me is that when I was 18 years old, Jesus saved me, and I've been following him faithfully ever since uh, by his grace. The second most important thing about me is that I'm married to Amber, and I have two daughters, Patience and Isabella. And uh, right now, my wife is out of town, left me at home with the children, which means I really understand what the Bible means when it says that she is my helpmate. Uh, The third most important thing about me is that I uh, have the ability to serve the members of Sixth Avenue Community Church here in Decatur, Alabama, as their pastor. And uh, that was a church revitalization. We started five years ago, and the church was about to die, and God has been very kind to bring it back to life. And then after that, the Lord has just allowed me to do some other cool things like the Defend and Confirm podcast, like be on the American Gospel platform, like write books and uh, and and do some debates and teaching and stuff. And yeah, so I'm just really honored to in any way be used uh, for the for the sake of his glory. Mm, wonderful, brother. Wonderful. Well, guys, uh, we're going to talk today with Sean about his book, and I usually put it up there for you. It's called uh, Health, Wealth, and the Real Gospel. The Prosperity Gospel Meets the Truth of Scripture. You wrote that with our friend Mike McKinley. And uh, can you tell us why you, why you guys both wrote it and uh, how yeah. it's being received? Yeah, I wrote it with Mike because uh, he's smart and I'm not. So uh, he knows how to write a book. I didn't. The when When I was approached and asked to write this book because of my experience with the prosperity gospel and coming out of the prosperity gospel, I was happy to do it, but I didn't really know how to do it. So I just kind of vomited out, you know, 35,000 words and then uh, Mike turned it into a book. (laughs) Uh, I laugh because um, if people only knew, like I'm, I'm a, I'm a little bit, I'm not a word, I am a word vomiter, but um, I'm an experienced word vomiter. So I laugh because as a fellow word vomiter, I, I'll just, you know, type out the first draft of whatever. My wife's like, you can write a first draft of a book, uh, maybe a hundred, 150 pages in two months, you know? Yeah. Uh, And, uh, but it's, it's not ready. (laughs) So most people, (laughs) most people don't know that so many of the, the authors that they read and enjoy, it really is the same thing that Mike and I did. It's just very often they don't put the other person's name on the book. So we just think it's a better practice and it'll show a little more integrity and give honor and credit and glory uh, to, to everyone involved. If we yeah. just go ahead and put both people's names on the book. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. Well, you told us a little bit about, you know, how you came out uh, of, or how you got, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into the, the prosperity gospel. You told us a little bit, maybe a little bit about how you got out, yeah. but maybe you want to touch on both of those things. Yeah. So when I got saved, I was 18, I was facing 20 years in prison and uh, I I got saved out of a life of drugs and gangs and violence and so on and so forth. And when I, when I got saved, uh, I was kind of a scary guy. I know it's hard to believe now, so many years later, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a buttercup, but back then I was a, a mean, scary ex-gangbanger. And I would try to go to churches 
in my neighborhood because I thought that's what I should do, go to church. And I was not particularly well received. The first person to ever really take me in and show me kindness and offer to help me read the Bible and understand it, and try to disciple me in following Jesus. Well, that person was in the prosperity gospel and I didn't know any better. Mm. So I was kind of taken in and taken for a ride. And um, thankfully, though, the the guy who taught me that stuff, he um, he always used to say, no matter what, make sure it's in the word. Right. Make sure you go back to the Bible. So that was the one good thing he trained me to do. But eventually I began to see that the prosperity gospel itself was not in the word. And uh, the Lord was very kind to leave me out of that. Mm. Mm. What exactly is the prosperity gospel, brother? Yeah, so this is it's a little tricky. I know uh, we like uh, succinct definitions, but prosperity gospel is really like an amalgamation of bad beliefs, um, and it can manifest itself in different ways. In the book, we use the example of like Mexican food, right? It could be a burrito, it could be a taco, it could be an enchilada, but the essence is always going to be meat, beans, cheese, tortilla, maybe some vegetables. And so those are the kind of the core elements of Mexican food. The core elements of the prosperity gospel are things like uh, an inversion of the creature creator distinction, right? So thinking that you can speak words and speak life into existence, that's something that only God can do, right? Uh, Another core element of the prosperity gospel would be seeking gifts above the giver, right? Valuing God more for what he can do than for who he is. In contrast, the psalmist who says, there's nothing I have besides you, uh, an aversion to suffering, right? Whereas scripture says that only when we suffer with Christ, can we, can we reign with him in glory? Uh, the prosperity gospel seeks to avoid suffering. And then there's, uh, an overrealized eschatology, which is you, you think that you're supposed to have all these things in the here and now, but scripture actually only promises many of, many of those things, not all of them, but many of those things after we have uh, gone to glory, things like a perfect, a perfectly redeemed body, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's really good. Really good. So then, um, you know, it might become obvious then what is so dangerous about it, but, you know, spell it out for us. What is so dangerous about the prosperity gospel? Well, it will lead you to hell. Uh, It's a false gospel, like every other false gospel. It is a gospel that cannot save. And um, yeah. Now, uh, if you are a true Christian, it's possible that you can come out of the prosperity gospel like I did. His sheep always hear his voice and follow him, and he loses none that the Father has given him. Uh, But um, if you don't belong to him from the divine perspective, it's possible that you can live your whole life thinking that you know the Lord Jesus and that you've believed in him for salvation, when in fact, you've believed a lie about him, you've believed a lie about God and what God has done in Christ to save you from your sins. Yeah, so over here, kind of the worst possible outcome is you, 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 you die in your sins. And then over here, kind of on the other end of the spectrum is that you're a true Christian, and you just kind of limp your way all the way to heaven, because you've believed a watered down, truncated, uh, weak gospel, because the prosperity gospel, it's not always the same. Sometimes it has overt, I mean, completely false gospel manifestations like Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen. Sometimes it's a little bit, um, it's a lighter fare, like Stephen Furtick, you know, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, those are the two options. You go to hell or you live your life as a, a really weak Christian. Mm, yeah. And then you have Todd or Todd White <laughs> and mm. and others. Yeah. On and on it goes. Yeah. Very good. Why why is it so important that we as Christians understand hermeneutics and what it is and engage in it? Yeah. So hermeneutics is just making sure that we know how to read our Bibles well so that we can discern uh, what God wanted to say to us in his word. Mm. And um, well, it's important because we need to hear God's voice in order to live and move and have our being in order to walk in obedience and having a sound hermeneutics means that we won't be led astray. We won't be tossed to and fro to quote Paul in Ephesians by every wind and wave, you know, we will be centered and grounded in a, in a, in a, in a right understanding of the truth of the gospel as it's revealed in his word, mm. because everyone's using scripture, 
right? Oh, yeah. Joel Osteen is preaching the Bible. Creflo Dollar is preaching the Bible. Joyce Myers, Todd White. We just go down the line. The Gnostics wanted to preach part of the Bible. Uh, Roman Catholics preach the Bible, right? Hermeneutics is how we make sure that we're actually not just having our ears tickled or that scripture isn't being twisted, but that we're actually reading uh, the, the true word, the message once for all delivered to the saints. Yeah, it's interesting. I've been studying the new apostolic reformation and just it's it's interesting that they would affirm probably mm, probably 50, 60 percent of everything that we believe about the Bible and the inspiration yeah. of the Bible. Uh, yeah. They might even affirm the in, infallibility of the Bible, but they by and large don't affirm the inerrancy of the Bible and even the yeah. authority of the Bible. But then you notice what they what they didn't say. They don't believe in the sufficiency of the Bible, that it's for faith and our faith and our practice for every area and stage of our lives. And so that's where I think the rubber meets the road, where that shows that actually you don't have a sound understanding of the doctrine of Scripture. And then if you don't have a sound understanding of Scripture, how can you have a right understanding of God? And on and on it goes, and of Christ and of salvation and, um, you know, all, all of it. I mean, it just... Because uh, theology, theology, our theology is interconnected. Um, every part has to be solid, you know, to, for the whole. And where do we get that? We get it from reading and studying, um, you know, the scripture. So we need to have a really strong and good understanding of scripture. Mm. Um, and that's what I see. Like you got Brian Simmons, who says that he has a extra, he, he said he had it for the passion translation, which is at the heart of the, the new apostolic reformation, they use it to preach from and everything. And he says that he had a, it was inspired by God to get this translation and so on and so forth. His, those are actually his words and um, sad. It's just tragic. It just goes back to what you just said. We, we have to have a good understanding of, of the Bible. Mm. Amen. Yeah. What are some core tenets of the prosperity gospel, brother? How should uh, biblically minded and informed Christians counter the core tenets of the prosperity gospel? Yeah, just by making sure you're well versed in the true gospel, make sure you know God's word. I mean, one of the easiest ways, the thing that undid me in the prosperity gospel was reading things in the word that just didn't square up with it, right? And eventually you're brought to a point where you have to try to reconcile now, some people choose to just live in cognitive dissonance, right? There's one thing that I think is true here, and there's another thing that's counterfactual to that. Rather than resolve it, I just live with this sort of dissonance of doctrine. Uh, but I couldn't live like that, so I had to try to reconcile it. So just stay in the Word, stay regularly consuming Scripture, and when you do, you'll start to see all kinds of things that eventually will uh, protect you from from those kinds of things yeah. like so a christian should be so used to understanding uh, a theology of suffering just by reading the new testament that if someone were to come along and say that god doesn't want you to suffer because he loves you that's just that it wouldn't jive it wouldn't make sense you would see so much from the bible that it is in fact precisely because god loves you that he allows you to suffer um he gives it to you as a gift that when if you were to hear that it would just it wouldn't it wouldn't ring true you know yeah yeah that's really good is that is that really like you think the main thing that you want to communicate to people that are in the prosperity gospel and maybe they're just trying to get out or figure out or maybe they're just coming out what 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 do you want to what do you want to say to them um what would be the main thing i would want to say to them yeah i, I think the the biggest issue if you kind of take the four core elements that i listed earlier of the, of the prosperity gospel I think the biggest issue is the creature creator distinction, right? To put yourself in the shoes of God, to take some of his incommunicable attributes and ascribe them to yourself is, um, is horrendous. You know, it's, it's, it's really, really bad. It may be the most offensive aspect of the product. There, there's all kinds of issues there, right? Valuing gifts above the giver, that's sinful. Lying about God when you share your false understanding of the gospel, that's sinful, 1 Corinthians. We can just go on and on. But to put yourself in the shoes of God and to say that you can do things that the Bible says only God can do, that may be the worst. So that, that might be where I would start. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really good. I mean, that's what Romans, that's Romans 1 right there. You know, right. we're elevating ourselves above God and then we're claiming the worship of self. So, 
Yeah. What are three principles of the prosperity gospel teaching on money and how should biblically minded and informed Christians respond to them? Three principles on money. That's oddly specific. Should I know three principles on money that they teach? I thought, I thought you mentioned that in your book. Oh man, maybe, maybe, maybe Mike all, did that part. Do you want me to, do you want me to restructure that question? I mean, no, no, no. I, I mean, I, I, I can just tell you, I can just kind of riff if you want. Go for it. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the prosperity gospel uh, takes money as an unmitigated good, whereas scripture says that it is uh, neutral and it can be used for good purposes and godly purposes, but it can also be used for wicked purposes. Scripture has a 10 to one warning to blessing ratio when it comes to money. So whenever it talks about money as being something good that you can use for the glory of God, there are 10 more warnings against it. And the prosperity gospel doesn't uh, recognize that the prosperity gospel also doesn't recognize that God is very often in the business of glorifying himself by taking away money, right? They, they think that, um, that it's a sure sign of God's blessing when we receive money. But, uh, in, in fact, it may be a sure sign of Satan's influence in our lives. That's what Satan promises Jesus. Um, and, and very often you see that when God loves someone, he removes, money is kind of representational for, you know, the bread of the bread, right? Like all of our, what we need, our bare necessities, our provisions. And you see in Deuteronomy, the Lord told his people, I let you hunger in the wilderness so that you might know that man shall live by, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. You know, he takes the prophet and he takes away all of his food and feeds him rancid meat scraps from the mouth of a raven, right? Uh, Jesus, beloved by God, more beloved than anyone, right? The perfectly holy, righteous, beautiful, obedient son uh, lives his life in poverty and then dies like a poor beggar on the cross, a criminal, a slave. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it says that money is always a sign of God's blessing when, in fact, it may be a sign of, of, of God's curse on our lives. Um, and then I, I think there's there's a, a misunderstanding of of uh, conversion. So when I, the conversion rate of money. So when I was in Peru, we had to exchange our dollars for soles and the exchange rate was like, you know, one dollar for two point seven five soles. And scripture is pretty clear that the more you invest in heaven, the happier you will be for all of eternity. And I just don't see that kind of investment happening in the process. I don't, I think their conversion rate is off. Um, because if, if they did understand that the more that God gave them, the more they would just sort of empty of themselves. But the more they think that God is giving them, the more they just invested in earthly things, you know? And then there's, of course, I guess, fourthly, there's just this idea that uh, sowing seeds, right. Is financial. It's yeah. not. It's, it's a number of different ways that the prosperity gospel does this Ephesians where it talks about every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. They interpret that to be carnal blessings. So yeah, those are some of the main ways that the prosperity gospel talks unbiblically about money. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's good to also say that, you know, God isn't against uh, us having, having money as a, as a matter of stewardship. So it's not saying, Hey, this is the Bible doesn't say, it doesn't forbid like Christians to have money. And we need to make that point because people can hear, well, we're, you're just kind of against money as a, as a Christian. And it's actually a matter of stewardship as you were discussing, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and it's, it's a matter of, Hey, how, what are you going to give like a second, is it second Corinthians six or seven? Um, I can never remember, but it's about generosity. It's about the heart motivation, you know, tithing and, and giving is a matter of the heart. Um, not the, not just the, the amount, but the, the posture of your heart. It's a matter of worship. And that's really, I think where Jesus goes, we're in Luke six forty five, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's a it's a matter of stewardship. It's a matter of our heart. It's a matter of our posture, and it's a matter of our worship. So, hmm. well, I know that you probably have a lot of experience uh, talking about this question, and I have a lot of experience talking to people about it as well. What's so dangerous about watching TBN, and why should it Christians avoid watching it? Yeah, I mean, you know, this question, I think. <laughs> 
I don't even know if it's relevant anymore. We even have a section on, you know, do TBN viewers go to heaven in our book? I don't even know if people watch TBN anymore. You know, most of this stuff is happening on the internet. So uh, whatever the new digital internet version of TBN would be, it's just bad because it's just false teaching. You know, it doesn't matter if you're listening to it on the radio or if you're going to a church or if you have an app, you just shouldn't, even if they have one good show that comes on there, you, you know, you, why even get that close to the edge of the precipice? You know, you can watch, uh, first of all, you can be a member of a healthy local church that preaches the gospel and be fed well there and not receive any outside teaching and you'll be great. But if you did want even more, if you're just a hungry Christian and you want to feast, I mean, there are just so many other places you can go and feast well. Ligonier, Desiring God, Nine Marks, you know, uh, there's just so many places you could go here, sound, faithful, biblical preaching. You can pick up, pick up a, a book of Charles Spurgeon sermons and go read a Puritan paperback or I don't know. Uh, if, I'm trying to think of like a more Arminian, you know, whatever, right? Like whatever, <laughs> you, can get, you can get something better than, than that. So there's just no need. Hmm. Yeah. That's really good. Um, I have family members, but two family members that that will watch, uh, you know, TBN and CBN. And it, it always concerns me. And I'm pretty much constantly telling them these family members to not watch it. So, you know, there is a good program on there, Kirk Cameron. But like you were saying, it's better to not uh, have people go and, and watch uh, that because, you know, then then they might watch uh a Brian Simmons or a Todd White or um, a a Bill Johnson and, you know, on and on it goes. So I I agree with you. I think that it's better to avoid uh, recommending or even getting into that. And there are probably other, other media and that they, that they have out there. So. Yeah. Well, how should we relate to our family in uh, friends and family members who claim to believe the true gospel, but have been deceived by the prosperity gospel. Yeah. You should just treat them like you would anybody else who uh, you can't really have confidence in their salvation. You should just treat them evangelistically. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. What's, what's the danger of rejecting the consolation of false doctrines of prosperity gospel but adhering to them, as you say, uh, in practice. Yeah. So in our book, we say that it's possible to, you know, not affirm any of these teachings explicitly. You might be able to sign off on a more orthodox statement of faith. Uh, you would never watch TBN or CBN or whatever other BN. Uh, but you might, you might harbor the prosperity gospel in your heart and not even know it. Because remember, one of the core elements of the prosperity gospel is valuing gifts above the giver. It's avoiding suffering. Um, and uh, that lives in all of us, right? So um, we just have to be on guard. We don't, we don't want to be pointing the finger and laughing at those guys over there, mocking them because they're off their rockers, which they are, but then functionally sort of living like them, uh, without, without realizing it, you know, so we have to just be ready and willing to embrace the life that God has called us to, you know, to, to live sacrificial lives, to use our money, to glorify God, to invest in eternity and the great commission to embrace suffering, even when it is impossible. And we can only do it by the grace and mercy of God, his spirit, empowering us, embracing that and giving the glory to God in the midst of that. Uh, showing that uh, we really do believe the true gospel. Mm, that's really good. Yeah. How should we help Christians uh, coming out of the prosperity gospel into a biblical understanding of, of the gospel and of life with fellow Christians in our local churches? Yeah. The number one thing I've, I've done this on multiple occasions, especially since the American gospel has come out, I'll get emails constantly. Hey, I saw it. I, I'm in a false church preaching false gospel, what should I do? And the number one thing I say is you have to get into a healthy church, right? So like, they're like, what books should I read? What sermons should I listen to? And I'm like, no, 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 not yet. First, you need to find a gospel preaching, Bible believing church, go there, submit yourself and, uh, and, and learn the true gospel in, in a gospel community and, and get healing and discipling and, 
and they can help you, you know, books to read or, you know, sermons to listen to or discussion groups or biblical counseling that you might need to, to, to spend some time in. All of that should be happening in the context of the local church. And, and thankfully, there are a number of different ways you can find healthy churches in your area. Uh, and some people are surprised to find that there are, in fact, healthy churches. They're like, there's nothing in my town. And then they'll go on the Nine Marks church search directory and they'll see, oh, actually there's, there's two churches in my town that I think are more solid and biblical, or they'll go on the gospel coalition church search website and try to find something uh, that can be useful for them. So yeah, priority number one, just plug yourself into a gospel preaching, Bible believing, healthy local church. That's really good. And I guess I would just say, you know, when you're there and you never know who's going to come through the doors. And so that's why we should be welcoming one another, welcoming people that we may not know and so on and so forth. Um, Because you know what? They might stay and then they might do everything that you said. And so I always, I always want to just state that because um, we can just get so easily go to the sit. I've been a Christian the like almost my entire life. And we, and I've seen this over and over again, we can just sit in the pew, not engage with anyone and then do it again. And then we do it again. We need to be really intentional about making sure that that we are caring for people that are walking through our doors. And that starts with not just the pastor, that starts with every member. So, Amen. Well, brother, I know that you're not on social media, so I won't ask you about where we can find you on social media. But right. can, can anybody, where can people find about more, uh, more about you on your website or anything like that? Yeah, they probably don't need to find out more about me. I mean... If, if they care about the prosperity gospel and they want to be better equipped to uh, combat it, to understand it, to evangelize people who may be lost in it, then pick up the book. We wrote it. We wrote it for you, for average, like not theologians, not PhD students. We wrote it. I'm a pastor. I wrote it for people in my church, right? If, if a member of my church comes to me and says, my coworker loves to listen to Joel Osteen, and I'm trying to figure out how to start that conversation this book is a book that I would hand to them and say, read this. And, and I think you'll feel uh, better equipped to, to engage with your coworker. So yeah, read that book and uh, hopefully it'll be profitable for you. That's really good, brother. That's really Yeah, good. man. Well, you know, there, as I always say at the end of these uh, shows, there's a lot that we could dive into and there's definitely a lot with this. And just as we wrap up, do you want to give us a few takeaways? Yeah. The only reason that we know the true gospel and that others don't is because the Lord has been very kind to reveal it to us. In Matthew 16, Peter uh, finally gets a right answer. The Lord says, you know, who do, who, who do you guys say that I am? And people say, oh, well, some people think you're this and some people think you're that. And he goes, no, but who do you think I am? And Peter raises his hand like a teacher's pet. And he says, you are the Christ. And, and, you know, Man, at a boy, Peter, right? This is the time you think Jesus is going to pat him on the back and be like, all right, you finally got one, bud. But Jesus says, you're correct. And just so you know, the only reason that you know that, the only reason, everywhere we go, right? People have eyes, but can't see. They have ears, but can't hear, right? They are, they are blind to my glory. They reject my identity. They love the darkness and hate the light. They cannot see me for who I am. But you, Peter, You can. The only reason you can is because my father who is in heaven has been kind enough to reveal it to you. Right. So as we think about people in the prosperity gospel or Roman Catholics or Mormons or spiritualists, you know, people with coexist stickers on the back of their right of their cars. The only reason that we know Jesus and we have we have trusted in the true gospel is because of his mercy and grace. So that should that should mean something for the way that we uh, champion truth and try to lead people uh, to the one true gospel. We should be people full of mercy and grace, gentle, correcting our opponents in gentleness with kindness. We should be abundantly patient and always prepared to offer people a reason for the hope that lives within us. Mm. That's really good, brother. You hit that. Thanks, you, hit a, you hit a home run on that one. That that was a grand slam. Take it, take there it from around the park, bro. I didn't even yeah. have to look down at my nose. Uh, I know that was like Seth Curry from half court. You know, nice. Uh, yeah, that's a He's basketball right. player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, okay, or, right. or the hole in one. Yeah, Seth Curry. Yeah, he plays for the Warriors. You know, okay. 
I'm guessing that's a basketball team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Golden All State. Right. Golden State. He's the right. greatest three point shooter. Uh, uh, and well, one of the greatest three point shooters in NBA history. But anyway, I digress. We're not a sports podcast. So, <laughs> but uh, brother, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, guys, uh, here's the book if you're watching the video. Um, we've been talking today with my friend Sean DeMars about his book, Health, Wealth, and the Real Gospel. The Prosperity Gospel meets the truth of scripture that he wrote with Mike McKinley. And uh, brother, thank you so much for your time today and uh, for for your ministry. Yeah, buddy. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Now, so I want to thank uh, Christian Focus for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, visit uh, ChristianFocus.com for great uh, resources on biblical references and theological works and the like. Uh, get 15% off uh, at checkout by entering code equipping at checkout. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of Equipping You Grace. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter, at Servants of Grace, on Instagram, at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.